In 2017, Mark French and Alan Johnson created the Aussie Solar Challenge, which was an attempt to cross the Simpson Desert from Alcazel Sabor to Birdsville with two modified Suzuki Sierras, which were converted to run fully electric and were to be charged with solar panels. They set the current world record in 2017, with Mark French crossing the desert in 4 days, 21 hours and 23 minutes, and Alan Johnson crossing the desert in 7 days, 5 hours and 6 minutes. In 2019, the University of Bochum in Germany tried to beat the current world record with their own built solar buggy. And when they asked for people with desert experience, I put my hand up as a lead vehicle and to offer my experience for the crossing. Part of the rules for the Solar Challenge world record is that everyone who is involved with setting up, driving, um, putting down the solar panels needs to be in the vehicle for the whole trip. So everything on Mark's and Danny's solar crossing was done by the two themselves. Setting up the panels, folding them back up, adjusting them correctly and also any maintenance on the car. Summer, what are we doing? Driving. Driving where? To closer to the desert. <clears throat> yeah, do you know what the next stop is? No. No, Farina Station. Oh yeah. Farina Station, we just left Peterborough, Willem and Judith. And now we're on the road, yep. aren't we? For three hours and 59 more minutes. Yeah, a bit longer, huh? We're having a look at the biggest gum, gum tree. tree in South, South Australia. Australia. Yeah. Giant red gum tree here. Out of Aurora. That is very thick. That's a big tree, isn't it? Uh-huh. Estimated to be around five no, it's fine, yeah. It's our pilot. Just in case we don't come back. <laughs> That's a helicopter. Summer, you excited? Yes, I'm nervous. <laughs> That's all right. On the way to Farina Station, we stopped at Parcelna and I saw helicopter flights. Given that Summer had never been in a helicopter, I thought it would be a good chance for her to have her first helicopter flight. I very much enjoyed getting the aerial view over the Flinders Ranges, not from a drone, but actually sitting in a helicopter. Awesome! It was only a short 15 minute flight, but some and myself thoroughly enjoyed it. Driving through Lindhurst, we had a quick stop at uh, Talk Alf, as well as the indigenous ochre pits. The harvested ochre from here had many uses with the Aboriginal society. It was used for trade, for ceremonies, as ornaments mixed with animal fat and applied to wooden tools such as shield and boomerangs. It was used for medicine, art and for burials. The colors early in the morning or late in the day are just spectacular. A little bit later, we reached the historic town of Farina, where we would meet the rest of the group. Farina was originally called the Gums and was settled in 1878 by optimistic farmers hoping that the rain follows the plough. The town was a railhead for a little while, until 1884, before the railway was extended to Marie. During the wet years of the 1880s, plans were laid out for a town with 432 acre blocks. It was believed that it would be good for growing wheat and barley. 
However, normal rainfall is nowhere near enough to grow these crops. Farina grew to reach a peak population of approximately 600 people in the late 1800s. In its heydays, the town had two hotels, the Transcontinental and Exchange, and an underground bakery, which now again is uh, operating two months of the year, powered by volunteers. The plan by the solar team was to have two days testing in Farina, and use some of the dunes on the station uh, to test the vehicle a bit more. I accompanied the solar channel in an advisory role and as a lead vehicle and not really for filming. So my filming effort is fairly limited, but I thought I still make something out of the little footage I have. Yes, that's a buggy. So did you wreck it already? Not working anymore? Yep. Good. We have to go home. Yes. That's a shame, but wow. that's life. Flips don't drive. <laughs> <laughs> preparation for the test run today. We had quite a mix of support vehicles who would carry uh, the German crew. And among them were two earth cruisers, one Iveco and one Fuso. Martin and Marine. Yeah, Jan Farina Station with the owner. And um, pretty much looking for some steep dunes where the guys can test the buggy a bit more. Ja, lass uns erstmal die einfachen Strecke machen. <laughs> yeah. Schwung, boy, schwung. Mm. Mm. Be very surprised if they get up here, I have to say. Trying to get a relative straight run up. The buggy had a bit less power than I expected and with the passenger and the 90 kg solar panel right over the rear axle, it really struggled to get up these fairly easy dunes. I've never driven an electro vehicle and really was keen uh, to drive it myself. So I wanted to see whether there is any chance to crawl up the dunes and uh, had a fairly slow approach. Back in camp it was charging time by the solar panels and the German team came up with the idea to remove the second driver and seat and move the 90 kg solar panels from the rear of the vehicle and center it a bit more on the passenger seat. That are the solar rayas. In the meantime, Darren and Kevin troubleshooted Spen's battery setup as it wouldn't charge his fridge. Also, more testing was required, and the Fuso with a 4 liter engine was thought to be the best recovery vehicle. Here, Pete is having the first attempt and seeing what is required to tow that buggy up there. I did another test drive this summer in the vehicle and the solar panels removed to see how much the weight really affect the drivability. And um, I'm glad to say it made actually a huge difference without the 90 kilogram uh, solar panel and a very light co-passenger, the vehicle did much, much better up that dunes. The next day we left Farina and made our way towards Mount Dea. The first stop was Marie and surprisingly the Lake Air Yacht Club was open, which I've never seen open, so we went in there and had a peek around. How are you? Eddie.
This is the remnants of one of the old Afghani camellia huts. So if you fancy a train, it's for sale here in Marais. The Central Australian Railway reached the town in 1883 and the first train ran in January 1884. We had to stop at Motonia, a sculpture park at Albert Creek, 30 kilometers west of Marie. All these sculptures are created by artist Robin Mutoid, who returns once a year to create a new sculpture. It is well worth to park your car and really venture inside the park and see these awesome outback art. Oh, look at that. You want to have a bath? Well, you need a spare tire for, mud. That's not how it should be. No. something here. The loose spare tire was quickly fixed by repositioning the bracket and just winding it back up tight. We had a quick look at the Beresford ruins and on the way back out there was a little steep incline which was fun to drive. Nice little camp at the riverbed here. A few little issues. Overheating brake only on one side. And Debbie's roof rack coming loose. Probably a bit too heavy. After a nice sunrise, I was packed in a bit earlier than the most of the other group, so I went to a close by siding and had a look around with Summer. The many siding stations were there to house the fettlers, which were the railwork maintenance crew for the Trans Australian Railway. They would patrol to the left and right of their station 20 to 30 kilometers and do all the maintenance work. They were supplied by sugar and tea trains which would stop and drop off supplies. Quite a harsh and isolated life, especially in summer where the temperatures could reach 50 degrees. The LJ Burkina Bridge is a Victorian area railway bridge located 55 kilometers uh, southeast of Ötnandeda. It was built by a team of around 350 men working in extreme desert heat. Several graves are nearby and one of them, David Saunders, died in January 1890 from heat disease. The bridge was opened in January 1892 and it was the longest bridge in South Australia. It crosses the floodplains of the Niels River and is prone to flooding. Next stop was Utnandeda for refuel and quick snack. Next we arrived at the Ringa waterhole which is about 120 kilometers north of Unandeda. It is quite amazing to be greeted by a kilometer long deep stretch of permanent water in the middle of the desert and in this very dry country. It is easy to see why this would have been very significant for the indigenous community.
Our camp spot for the night was Mount Dare, where we also would do the final fuel up for the desert crossing. Oh, Spence! Did you have two of them? Yeah. Did you lose that now? Hey? Did you lose the second one now? Oh, I found it. Mount Dare, oasis in the desert. Beautiful. After final fuel up, we were all on our way towards Dalhousie Springs. It's a possum waterhole on the way towards Dalhousie. Look at it. Mm -hmm. There was water in, huh? It's beautiful along the river though. Oh. Dalhousie Springs, also known as Wichera Springs, is a group of 60 natural Artesian springs located in the Wichera National Park, on the western fringes of the Simpson Desert. As you probably can imagine, the springs formed a part of the Aboriginal tradition and life in northern South Australia. The place is associated with many dreamtime stories and songs. We couldn't go past it without a little swim However, the temperature of the springs ranges from 38 to 43 degrees and with 40 degrees outside it wasn't really refreshing. Alex lost one of his fuel tank bolts when he left uh, Mount Dare. He returned back and they had some replacements for him and he's just making sure that that all holds. Yeah, we're just about to stop at Perny Boar here. Hopefully no one is there. No, there are people there. And um, camp here for the night, I guess. Stay tuned for the next episode, where things don't go to plan at all. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. As always, I would greatly appreciate if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video and leave me a comment in the comment section. My YouTube channel is completely self-funded and it takes considerable effort, time and money to create these videos. If you'd like to support me in this, please consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon, where you can donate a small monthly contribution which will help me to cover some of the cost. For these you will receive early access to all of my videos.